Good morning, Calvary Chapel family. This is Pastor Matt. I just wanted to provide a, a quick update about what's going on here at Calvary Chapel. Glad you're with us for our Calvary at home worship experience. And we're really praying and trusting that the Lord is ministering to you all as we're all uh, getting used to our new normal. Uh, really just thinking about Hebrews 10 23 that where the, the author said that let us hold fast to the confession of our faith for he who promised is faithful and uh, we're just thankful that the Lord is so faithful to us during these times as we're uh, quarantined as we're uh, figuring things out as kids and spouses are all uh, kind of stir crazy we're just trusting that the Lord would be faithful to us during this time uh, we wanted to let you know that the church staff, the elders, the uh, leaders here miss our church family very much. And uh, it's times like this when we really appreciate the fact that this is, uh, the church is not a building, it is the people. It is us, the body of Christ, and it's one another that we miss the most. So we're really looking forward to being back together with the church family again very soon. We're trusting the Lord will reunite us. As you know, we're on a two-week pause as asked by our governor, and we feel that uh, it's best to postpone and push the pause button for all of our April events. We're moving our baptism service that was scheduled for Sunday, April 5th to uh, May 31st, and we're praying that the Lord will allow us to have our, our traditional family service afterwards where we potluck and barbecue and just enjoy a time of celebration, and uh, we're, we're praying that that is, that is the the, the case. Uh, also, if need be, we're going to broadcast our Good Friday and Easter services on the 10th and the 12th. Um, you know, Jesus conquered death, and certainly we're not going to be conquered by the COVID-19 uh, bug, but uh, we're going to celebrate that day, and we'll do so online. We just praise God for technology. Hey, and though we miss our Calvary family so much, we're really excited about Calvary at Home. It's a hub for us to connect with each other online, and uh, you can find it at ccfred.org. Our website, there's a tab there, it just says Calvary at Home. Uh, there's a way to minister to the whole family, for our youth, for our kids, uh, for the men's and women's group. We, we have ways of connecting there. Uh, for the whole family, we have our Wednesday and Sunday live services will be broadcast there. You'll be able to capture that. There's instructions and uh, for our youth. Uh, Seth will connect you with all of their social media and Zoom meetings. Our children's ministry, the Shauna and Janelle, are super excited to bring you virtual Sunday school. And it's going to be an exciting time for the kids to connect there. And for again, for our men and women, all of our teachings will be posted right there at Calvary at Home. So, uh, Lord willing, we'll be back together very soon. But we want you to know that we care for you. You are prayed for. You are loved. Uh, if this is new to you, if you've or if this is your first time visiting us here at Calvary at Home, we ask you to just comment below. Um, uh, make send us a message. Uh, we would love to see our, our Calvary family's wonderful faces. So do us a favor: snap a photo on your on your phone and uh, hashtag it CC Fred at Home. And uh, you can see that again below down there, CC Fred at Home. We would love to see your wonderful faces and post those on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, let us know how we can pray for you. Go to ccfred.org. There's a, a place where you can ask for prayer. And remember, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. Please be mindful of uh, ministry opportunities as so many people are in need right now. Uh, stay connected with one another and let us know how we can be involved. We want to minister in Jesus' name. So know that you are loved. We care for you. Continue to, to worship the Lord and uh, we'll look forward to being together with you very soon. Hey Calvary families, I'm Janelle. And I'm Shauna. And we are sanitizing up. And we are also super excited about virtual Sunday school that we have available at Calvary Chapel Fredericksburg. Check us out at the Calvary at home button on the website. We're gonna have printables, we're gonna have kids worship, we're gonna have lessons, we're gonna have some fun family challenges for you guys over the next couple weeks and maybe longer. Stay tuned for updates. We miss you guys. Love you, bye. 
Hey, my name is Seth Ramirez and I'm the youth director here at Calvary Chapel Fredericksburg. And in order to keep community alive amongst our youth, we're going to be having uh, two meetings throughout the week. Uh, the first meeting is for middle school and high schoolers on Thursday nights at 6.30. It's going to be a Zoom call. Um, and also high schoolers, we're going to be doing a Zoom call on Saturdays at 6.30 as well. And you can find those um, if you follow us on our Facebook page. Uh, which should be up or down or it's gonna be around this video so if you find the exalt youth Facebook page and click that link and like it we'll be posting all of our updates there thank you well good morning Calvary Chapel family we're glad that you're joining us here this morning at Calvary at home one of the first of maybe many hopefully not too much of uh, doing this as we worship together still here we're located in our church and yeah, there may not be people, you guys may not be here, but the church is not limited to this building. It is us. We make up that church. So we want to invite you this morning to worship with us. It doesn't matter if you're in front of a TV screen or your iPhone. You can still stand with us. You can still worship. You can raise your hands. You can kneel. In whatever way the Lord is prompting you to worship this morning, we want to welcome you to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we get to gather still Lord, thank you for technology, how we can use it to our advantage to still glorify you on this day, Father. We ask that you be in this place. Your Holy Spirit guide us, Lord. And, and with everything going on around us in the midst of it, Father, we pray that we don't lose our hope. We don't give into fear, Father, because you tell us not to. You don't want us to be robbed of our joy. So let us worship this morning with joy, knowing that you're a God of victory. You're a great God who has overcome and who has defeated so many plagues in the past. We read it in scripture and, and you'll do it even today, Father. But we, we welcome whatever you want to do this morning in our homes, with our families, in our country. Lord, let us worship you and lift your name up because you are worthy to be praised. In your name we pray, amen. Let us worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero, oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Sing, you've been faithful. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you'll do it again. And I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen. God, you do great things. Oh, yes, you do. God, you do great things. Oh, hero. Oh, hero of heaven. You conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. We're going to sing hallelujah, God above it all. Hallelujah, God above. 
of it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. We continue to sing hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. We free every captain and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awaken the light oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things you have you have done great things hope is built my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus but and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus see my hope my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus, but in righteousness. I dare, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Christ alone is the cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of darkness seems to hide his face i rest on his unchanging grace every high in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil yes my anchor Shall come 
when he shall come with trumpet sound Dressed in his righteousness alone For less to stand before the throne For less Him through the storm, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of
Sing, I see the King of glory. Yes, Lord, you are seated in the highest throne, Lord. 
We praise your name, Hosanna. We thank you that we get to worship you, Father. Bless us now as we gather together as a church and hear from your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Calvary. Welcome to our online Calvary at Home service. You know, you look around, the building's closed, but the church isn't, amen? And you know, the sanctuary's empty, but our homes aren't. And we're living at such a time as this. Um, this is all new to us, so we're still trying to figure things out. But praise God that we can come into your home with the Word of God, and you guys can gather together as a family and enjoy a time of just worship as we did and, and now the Word of God. You know, and I just thank God that church, we took it not for granted um, that for, in our gathering together in the past, nor will we take it for granted once we're able to come together. But that is so sweet that we gathered as we have been commanded to do by the Bible, that we're friends, that we're brothers and sisters in Christ, we're family. And it's so sweet to know that as we go through this pandemic, as they call it, um, to know and pray and ask God to, uh, to keep us through this. And soon we will be gathering again as a family. I do, I do miss you. I, I'm looking out here at these empty seats and I, I can see the faces where a lot of you uh, planted yourself and you, you owned your own seat. Looking over here at this crowd that usually... Uh, is half asleep. I still love you guys. I still loved you guys, you know, but uh, it's just kind of interesting, sad, but joyful that we can come into your home. Uh, I also want to thank everyone who's put time and talent into making this service possible. You all know who you are, and I really appreciate, and I do miss all of you. We miss you. We love you, and soon we will gather again. But, you know, as looking in our study, and please turn, if you have a Bible, to Ephesians chapter 6. When looking at our study, I don't think it's a coincidence that God has had us uh, do a kind of a series through the book of Ephesians on uh, the wife's role, the husband's role, and then the marriage, and then family, and then take us into the workforce. I don't think that was a coincidence. As we'll talk about spiritual warfare today. I think in this series that we just finished, God would want us now to practice what he has commanded us to be. Uh, either you're, you're children, either you're uh, a wife or a husband, and you're a family, uh, and in your marriage. And so uh, he has a way of bringing application, doesn't he? But we do pray that this soon will pass. So we come this morning to really the, the last section of the book of Ephesians. If you remember how we introduced the book back when we first started. Uh, here, Paul would have us to stand. He would have us to stand. Uh, we know that in chapters 1 and 3, he instructed us to sit. To sit and receive. And then in chapters 4 and 6, he wanted us to walk out that which we learned in sitting. And now as we begin this um, study this, uh, this morning in 6.10, in Ephesians 6, verse 10, he would want us to stand. So let's read, beginning in verse 10, and we'll read down to verse 17. Ephesians 6, verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we've read your word as we always do. We 
honor you, Lord God, by reading the word of God. And now we would ask that you would give, Lord, us, this church, those who are, are watching, the sense, the understanding, the application, the illustration, God, going beyond my notes. For many of us, these are very familiar passages. For some of us, it's the first time we have read them. But wherever we're at, God, we know that you would speak to us. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul will speak of the Christian armor. He will help us to understand this armor as we read, as he symbolically uh, used a Roman soldier's battle gear. And if we remember our introduction to this book, this book of Ephesians, who is Paul chained to at this point? That's right, he's chained to a Roman soldier. So he has a living illustration. Now, I'm not sure if he has all his battle gear on, but remember, Paul was a Roman citizen. And a Roman citizen saw these soldiers uh, dressed up all the way with their battle gear. And so he's going to take that now, and he's going to utilize, uh, I believe it's, uh, what is it, six pieces of that gear, and he's going to apply it to our walk in Christ. It's very interesting how he does this. Uh, and, and he realizes, he's a great teacher, he re realizes that utilizing this application, it gives us visual, it gives us a visualization uh, of our, our strength and courage and, and, and how it comes uh, and who it comes from. And he, and he helps us not only to visualize, but realize that we are in a constant what? A constant battle. A constant battle in an unseen war, really. People probably think we're crazy sometimes. But it is, in a sense, an unseen war with our enemy. And he'll introduce our enemy to us as we read here in these verses. So he begins by having us dress for battle. And in doing that, he identifies who the warrior is. Again, look at verse 10. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Let's just stop right there. The warrior is the believer. You and I are in a war, brothers and sisters in Christ. Hey, you're in the army now. Ain't no use in looking down. Ain't no discharge to be found. You know that. We are in the army when we accepted Christ. Well, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for that. Well, we are in the army. We're in God's army. And we are on active duty. There is no, uh, as we would say back in the day, there are no uh, men or women uh, retired on active duty. No, we are on active duty right now. So we must be an attentive soldier. We must not be tangled up in the affairs of this world. The enemy would have us to do that to get us off kilter, to, to get our eyes off the Lord, and to have us be right in the center of a battle that, that we were not prepared for. Our strength, as notice here in that verse, comes from the Lord. And our ability to battle through is found in the power of his might. A warrior of the Lord prepares himself for war, by understanding that first before he even takes a step outside in that world, in, in, in that mission field uh, called the, the, the world. He must prepare himself. And in doing so, Paul tells us the way he prepares himself for war. Notice by putting on the whole armor of God. Notice Paul did not say some of the armor of God. No, he doesn't say some, but the whole all of the armor, it's available to us. It's really, as the end, you'll see, the armor of God is Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. He's our all in all. But he doesn't say some. We, we don't call upon the name of the Lord. We don't call upon the Holy Spirit, his strength. We, we don't walk at a distance with God. He's constantly with us. We must know that. We have to put the whole armor of God on. For this reason, notice again, that you may be able to stand. That, may, that word stand means immovable, <laughs> firm, to stand ready and prepared without wavering, guys. Against what? 
against the wiles. Notice that, the wiles of the devil, against the wiles. That word wiles, it's an interesting word. It's methodia, methodia. And it means this. In English, it means method. We get our word method from it. In the Greek, it's crafty, deceitful schemes. And he is deceitful. He is crafty, man. Just remember back in Genesis how crafty he was with Eve. And here he does the same thing. He has no new plan. He has no new things. He, everything is the same. Oh, they may look different, but they're always the same. He's a crafty enemy. And he, he identifies our enemy. He is the devil. And the devil is real, guys. He's real, man. He is. This armor, as Paul speaks of, the armor of God, which is the, the, the title of this message, by the way, the Christian's armor of God, uh, it is here, he identifies our enemy, and it gives to us confidence to stand against the devil. This is our armor, Christian, and it has been tested and tried, and listen, found to be fit for battle, and we need to put it all on and keep it on. Keep it on as you visualize it, as you understand what he speaks of. You know, I was thinking about David. Remember King David before he was king? He was just David the shepherd boy, just a young, ruddy kid, you know. But as he heard that this Goliath guy, this giant, was coming against God's people, he went out to fight the giant. And you remember, uh, before he went out, uh, King Saul wanted to interview him. And he looked at him and he says, well, son, uh, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your, your bravery. You're a very uh, uh, young man, but hey, why don't you try my armor? Put my armor on. He tried to put his armor on David. But we find out that it didn't fit, nor had David tested it. You see that? David couldn't go out to battle with somebody else's armor. That armor wasn't tested. That armor did not fit. But what David had tested, listen, was his faith in the Lord. And it seems at this time Saul's faith in the Lord was starting to weigh or, or starting to go away, starting to wane. And so he went into battle, as you know, King David did, with a staff, five smooth stones, and a sling, and a shepherd's bag. That's what he was used to. He fought the lion. He fought the bear with that. This was his armor, but it was tested, guys. He tested his faith in the Lord with it. And that gave to him the confidence to stand against this giant. As a matter of fact, there in 1 Samuel 17, David was say to Goliath, you know this. He says this in verse 45, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then he would go on to say this. For the battle is whose? That's right. The battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into my hands. I love that. He hasn't even fought him yet. And he's really claiming victory. You know why, Christian? Because just as David stood and fought, he fought from victory. He didn't fight from defeat. He knew that he was going to win this battle. He knew he was going to win this fight. Now, verse 12 and 13, he speaks on the war, our war. That was David's battle. This is our war. Notice he says, for we don't wrestle. That's, that's, that's combatives. That's hand to hand. That's, that's up close. And, and we'll speak of this again in a second. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And although many times, though, Satan works through man, right? He influences uh, man, evil men. He influences uh, people to steal, kill, and destroy because that's his calling card. Satan, listen, you got to know this. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood because Satan is, is a created being. And please know he's not the opposite of God. A lot of times we think he's the opposite of God. Now, when you think he is the opposite of good, he is the opposite of, uh, you know, of, of the good things uh, that we, we come to know. But he isn't the opposite of uh, of God, and, and the reason why I say that is, listen, God is omnipotent, he's omniscient, and he's omnipresent. In other words, he's all-powerful, God is, he's all-knowing, and he's everywhere. And I'm not saying Satan isn't powerful. I'm not saying that, but Satan is not God. 
And so our enemy has organized, it seems that he has organized a spiritual army under his leadership. Notice it says, but against, this is what we fight against. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Man, that scares you if you're reading that about 12 midnight. But that's true. Some scholars have called these the demons, these created angels that fell away from God's presence in rebellion along with Satan. He says, therefore, knowing this information on our enemy, knowing our enemy, who he is, knowing this information, that that we who live a spirit-filled life are in a spiritual battle. But Paul tells us to take up In other words, it means to take up in order to use. Don't just take it up. Take it up and put it on. To take up in order to use the whole armor of God. Again, he mentions this. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Listen, that gives us hope, doesn't it? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now, this evil day isn't really a specific day. uh, But it's those days, and you know it, right? When temptation and the flesh seems to be the hardest on us. I mean, it's just coming at us, man, left and right. It's in those days. And it doesn't mean that we don't keep it on and continue to walk in the Lord, uh, knowing that, that we are always prepared for battle. But especially, Paul specifically speaks of those days, those days when we are tempted, those days that seem hardest for us. John Gill, the comp- uh, the expositor and commentator explains the evil day this way, in which sin and iniquity abound, error and heresy prevail. We've been in those times, we've been in those pits where we've, we've, it just seems that, man, I am being bombarded in the flesh. I'm being bombarded in my mind. And it's at those times as we begin to stand firm and For many of us, it sounds like every day. But, you know, we're in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. He says, and having done all, having gone through every struggle of the fight, the Greek speaks of, having done all, he says to stand. Stand, Christian. Stand. Paul loves to encourage the believer to stand because the enemy's main objective is to have us what? Fall. He's he's to have us fall. He wants the believer to fall. He wants to take us out of, we could say, the game. He wants to take us out of the way. He doesn't want us to be out witnessing. He doesn't want us out to be the the salt and the light. If he he can take us out, it doesn't mean we're losing our salvation. He just can take us out. Then That's one less warrior that he has to worry about, you see. His goal is to have us fall. Paul's encouragement now is to have us stand. We can stand. Amen? All right. And now he starts, speaks of this armor. And again, uh, many of us have, have heard this. And by the way, if you have kids right now, why don't you have them get some paper and some crayons or whatever they have and start drawing a Roman soldier. And start drawing these, start drawing, you know, the, the helmet, the gird, the, the belt, the breastplate. And, and they can put the, you know, w- what they mean for us, the application for us, if you want. But I just thought that would be kind of cool. But anyways, he says there in verse 14, stand therefore, or these things being so. What he just told us, stand. This is his third exhortation. You think he wants us to stand? He wants us to stand firm. This is his third exos, huh? How do you say that? Exor- exhortation to stand and be ready. Stand and be ready. I mean, Paul will speak of a Roman soldier's six main pieces of his battle uniform here. And in doing so, he will also bring to us what it means as a Christian. The, the application or the illustration for us, uh, how, how it speaks to us. As believers, he says there, having girded your waist with truth. Well, that just means to to fasten a belt. Fasten your belt, he says, your waist with truth. He begins with the warrior belt. Uh, Here, this belt was essential for the soldier, for it gathered together his tunic. Back then, they wore skirts, and uh, they didn't want anything to impede or to... uh, 
to trip them up, right? You're in battle. That's the worst thing you could do is to fall, you know? So they would use this belt. They would tighten it up, cinch it up so tight, you know, so that they can move quickly, that they can be, uh, you know, able to move out in battle. This belt was also uh, used as a, for utility use. In other words, it was to hold the sword. It was where the scapard, it was to hold his sword as well. So it was very important. Paul says here, the, the Roman soldier must gird his waist. But for us as Christians, he's telling us to gird our waist with truth. It's truth that binds us together. It's the truth that keeps us together. The truth here, guys, the Christian belt is that of truth. Once again, we know that Satan is a He's a liar, right? And he works in the field of lies. We are to stand and not wobble. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall. We are to be better than weebles. We are peoples of God. And, and so we are not to wobble in doubt or untruth. Truth can dispel and dismiss lies and set us free. When you know the truth, you know that whatever comes at you, man, that you have cinched up that belt of truth. And there's nothing going to be folded in. Nothing's going to keep you from knowing the truth of all things. The truth of the scripture. The truth of who Christ is. The truth of who we are. Who we are in Christ. And I love that. All Satan is, is he comes to bring lies. Here Jesus, who is the truth, said this in John 8. 31 and 32. He says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you what? Shall make you free. That's right. All one of you. And there's only one here. So now now I can say that. And then he says, having put on the breastplate, man, the breastplate covered the soldier's front and back. The, the vital area, protecting the vital organs from sword or arrow. It was a very important piece of gear. And for the Christian, he says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So you have your belt of truth. And now you have the breastplate of righteousness. And this is another truth that the enemy attacks the believer on. Our righteous stance. Our righteousness of who Christ says we are. We are righteous, not from our own merits, not from our own doing, but totally because of Christ, who is our righteousness. Christ looks at us and says, you are right. You are right with God. You are right with me. And the enemy comes, and you know that. He comes and says, you're not righteous. Look at the thoughts you thought. Look at the things you did. Those are lies from the enemy. It speaks of our justification by grace alone in Christ alone. We are righteous because God deems us so based upon Christ, our Savior and Lord. Have you ever fallen in your walk? Don't don't raise your hand. I can't say it anyway. Seth, don't raise your hand. But anyway, have you ever fallen in Christ? And probably the answer is yes, I have. And some of us feel like that commercial. I've fallen and I can't get up. No, you can get up. You can get up. You can get up for a righteous man, the scriptures tell us. A righteous woman, the Bible says, may fall seven times and rise again. Rise again because of truth. Rise again because who you are in Christ. You are righteous. That is truth. Bind it around you. Understand it. Take that breastplate. Don't take it off. So get up, man. Get up and get back in the battle. Battle? The Bible and the battle. Get back into it. We must guard our heart, guys. We must guard our heart with all diligence, with the breastplate, and again, of Christ's righteousness. And having shod, that is an interesting word, shod. It means to bind under or shod your feet, to bind under. On your feet, uh, it speaks again of the soldier's leather half-boot sandal. Just think about it. Again, if you have a dictionary, your kids may may have a picture of that Roman soldier. You can see it there. It it allowed the toes to be free, free toes, 
I don't like, uh, I only like, anyway, forget about it. But yet, yet, yet under these studded soles, under these soles are, are like cleats. They're studded. They're, they're, are, they're, they're, like, they're like cleats. And they helped the soldier from slipping and maintaining the soldier's position to what? To stand, you know, it's just like an athlete. Just like any, any of our uh, athletic activities, when you're in it for competition, you need good shoes, and many times you need with cleats on them. And helps the soldier's position to stand against his, his enemy. For the Christian, he says, having, your sh- sh- having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I love what Stott says. He says, these are gospel boots. I love that way he says that. We know that peace is the absence of conflict. Peace here is the absence of conflict. And the gospel brings that peace. For Christ Jesus himself is our peace. He's our peace, guys. Satan hates the gospel because it's good news. He's all about bad news, man. You know, you, I, he's loving this whole thing that we're going through now. He's loving that, ha, ha, the church can't meet, the church can't gather. You want to make a bet? We took advanced technology like this, and we were able to go into the homes. We were able to go into your, your studies, and we are able together to pray, to read God's word, to agree, to say amen. You know, this is a great time also, guys. To invite your neighbors or to let them know of the website and tell them maybe they would never go to a church, but maybe they'll sit in their living room and hear the word of God taught. Be praying for that. Be praying for those opportunities. But peace is the absence of conflict. And Satan does hate the gospel. And keeping our gospel boots strapped, we share this gospel of peace with others. We share it. It's the gospel of peace for us, yes. But it's also the gospel of peace not for us to keep to ourselves. It's the gospel of peace. It's the feet. It's the boots that we walk in. Shot at our feet. Tighten it up. But it's for all of us to share with others as well. God sees this as a beautiful work of the believer. You know Isaiah 52, 7. It says this in the NLT. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. Now, if you look at my feet, especially my toes, they're not beautiful at all, man. I got got crooked toes and stuff. My wife's feet are beautiful, but my feet aren't too beautiful to see. But God says they are because I'm a believer in Christ. God says, hey, Mark, you take what you know about me now, and it gives you that peace. Now you share that gospel with others. Hey, Mark, you got beautiful feet now, man. God says, I got beautiful feet. The feet of the messenger who brings good news, the good news of peace and salvation. People want that today. There are people scrambling, fearful, man. You know, there are people that just don't know what they're going to do. You know, they're looking at at situations that never have come to pass yet. It's all dark to them. It's all worry. And I'm not saying that many of us, you know, don't have anxieties during this time or or not a little fearful. But we have the Lord. We have the, the gospel boots, man, that we could stand on. We have the truth. We we have this this confidence in Christ, this righteousness. And we need to tell others of that. The good news of peace, the good news of salvation, the news that God of Israel reigns. He's the God yesterday, today, and forever. And we need to be able to have that opportunity, guys, as it comes to share. When you're at Costco, when you're at BJ's, keep your distance, but share. Hey, hey, you want to know no, about Christ? Anyway, he says, verse 16, and above all, in addition to what he has just written, in addition to these pieces, he says, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts, the incendiary arrows. You didn't think I could say that word, did you? These were arrows. These were arrows that were dipped in pitch, then lit and launched. Oh, they knew how to throw, those those were their missiles at that time. 
He says it's of the wicked one. Guys, there is, a, there is an enemy. There is a devil. There is a wicked one. Truly, he is our adversary. He is our enemy. Above all, he says, taking the shield. Now, you know the Roman soldier's shield. This was not the small shield that sometimes we see. This that he's speaking of is that large four-foot by three-foot oblong shield made of leather and uh, stretched over wood with iron rims fitted uh, along the edge that could protect the whole body. And when a, a garrison or, or a, a platoon or a squad of, of Roman soldiers could get together, when these fiery arrows would come, they'd get together and, and be able to protect themselves uh, from, those, from those arrows. It was the large one. It was the bigger, the bigger shield. And during the battle, the soldiers would do this. Check it out. They would drench this shield with water so that the fire arrows would be extinguished when they hit them. And we, too, are told that the water of the word, man, we need to be drenching ourselves in it. We need to be preparing ourselves through it as we go into battle. Before the Christian, he says here that the shield of faith for us is for when you are, will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Our shield is our faith in God. And he protects our vital organ, which is the heart. That seat of emotions. That is where our identity in Christ lies. In our heart, our soul, our spirit. Who we really are. And it protects that because that's where the enemy comes, doesn't he? He comes to attack there. Faith here, as Martin Lord Jones states, means the ability, listen, to apply quickly what we believe so as to repel everything the devil does or attempts to do to us. And as the flaming arrows of the enemy come at us, flaming arrows like doubt, flaming arrows like fear. I mean, it's all over us, right? Flaming arrow, a- arrows that are the opposite of our known faith. Not to mention disobedience, rebellion, lust, or anything that will get us to totter from our standing position. We have to, listen, apply our shield of faith. We have to. Know who you are. Apply that shield of faith. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those. I love that. He is a shield. Christ is our shield to those who put their trust in him. Have you put your trust in Christ? I pray you have. And if you haven't, then you can. It's a simple prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. A prayer just to God. Asking him to forgive you of your sins. And to come live in you. Do you believe he died on that cross for your sins? Man, it's just a prayer. How many people are taking their last breath without just saying a very simple prayer. God made salvation. I use the word simple. There probably is a better word for us to just come to him. He's approachable. He's available. He's here now. He says, come to me. But we have to humble ourselves. And that's our problem as men and women. We, we are too filled with pride. He says, look it, you're in your home. May not, may not be anybody there with you. What a great day to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What a great day to have him be your shield of faith. And so he goes on, he talks about the helmet as we wrap this up. He says, the helmet, of course, for the the Roman soldier was used to protect his skull. There's no worse wound than a head wound. You know that. If, If someone has a head wound, that's one of the most difficult types of wounds to deal with in battle. He knew he needed to protect his head. But for the Christian, he says, he calls it the helmet of salvation. The mind is our thinking mechanism, isn't it? It's a beautiful mind God created. It's, it's, it's complicated, and it's that way because, well, he wouldn't be God if, if it wasn't in a sense. It's just a very interesting mechanism that God created for us to know and understand, again, what is truth, right? What is true? This helmet protects our thought life, doesn't it? It protects our thoughts from the enemy who loves to attack our mind, who loves to pay rent in your mind. I always say that. My kids know that. I always say that. 
Don't let the enemy pay rent in your mind. But why do we do that? You know, why, why do we allow that? No, we have that salvation. It, it, he, he wants to invade our minds with false accusations, false interpretations, false teachings, false thoughts, some unclean thoughts, just things that just continually are barbar- bombarding us. Second Corinthians 4, Paul wrote, Satan, who is the God of this world, and and he is, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. He's gotten into the minds of many who don't believe with lies. Well, they're all roads lead to God. Uh, You know, when we die, we're like a light bulb. It'll just go off and they'll uh, unplug it, put it back in a little package and throw it away. That's all life is. That's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The helmet of salvation is the helmet of hope that God protects us from, attacks on the mind by reminding us of our salvation. Jesus is my salvation. And with this helmet, we can hold up our head with joy and confidence in the work, the finished work on the cross that has saved me, that has saved you. Listen, completely, completely. And I proclaim his name, man. Many of those times when I'm doubting, I shout it out, you know, like that commercial. Shout it out. I like that. There's just something about that name Jesus, isn't there? Master, Savior, Jesus. It's like the fragrance right after the rain. Remember the fragrance after the rain? Ah, yeah, the Lord Jesus. And then he speaks of the sword. And so far, all the pieces of the armor that we talked about, Paul has mentioned, were for the soldiers, what? For his defense. This last piece, the sword, is the only offensive weapon that the Roman soldier had. This particular sword Paul speaks of was not the long sword, not the, it was the two-foot-long double-edged sword used to advance against the enemy and defeat them. Let me tell you, with that sword, you had to get up close and what? And personal, that's right. Up close and personal. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't Up close and personal, you see. The application for the Christian again, Paul says he calls it the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Up close, the word of God, knowing it, understanding it by the spirit who gives us the ability to know what we're reading, to apply it. It's the offensive weapon, yes, it's the spirit-inspired word of God. Now, this word is not logos. We're, we're familiar with that word, this word for word. But it's the word rima, the applied word, the living word, the spoken word of God. The sword of the spirit being applied to both for the Christian, yes, offensive, but also, if I could say, defensive situations. The word of God being referred to as a two-edged sword, we know, is living, powerful, sharp. Scripture says, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints and marrow, the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's, it does its work, doesn't it? You know, that's in Hebrews, the conviction. But the wonderful application of it, it, it does its work. It's powerful. It's God's word. It's rima. It's the spoken word. Jesus in the desert, as he was in a full battle, man, this was a full attack. I mean, he was in battle with the the enemy, with Satan. He used the written word, the rima word. He used the written word, the sword of the spirit of God, in in, in offense. Uh, He was, uh, he he did this uh, with every jab. And with every parry or sidestep, if you, I was thinking about, you know, how, how they taught us how, how to fight with fixed bayonets and how to, how to fight with a rifle, how to parry to the left. And, parry, and what you're doing is you're, you, it's just like a boxer anyway. He prefaced his, his uh, sorting, his, his wording with every jab and every sidestep with this. It is written. It is written. And you know, he said, it is written. And every time he was attacked, he said, man shall not live by bread alone. 
Deuteronomy 8.3. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 6.16. And it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him you shall serve. Deuteronomy 6, you'll find it also in Deuteronomy 10. He used the word of God. He used the written word, the living word, the word that was written to battle the adversary, Satan. In a time where Satan came at him, uh, he, he, that was a low blow to come at him after 40 days and 40, and 40 nights there in the desert. And with that, we just know that we need to put all of this armor on. In closing, now that Paul has prepared us for war, I want you to read ahead as we close out this wonderful book where Paul shows us how to fight our battles. And again, from victory and not to defeat. But friends, listen, the bottom line to all of this, what Paul is saying, is for us to be ready, to be fit, and to be outfitted for battle. And, and, and through all of this, the armor that we have, again, think about it, go back, read it, see it, it's Christ. It's putting on Jesus Christ. It's, 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 as we said, it's being a spirit-filled Christian, uh, relying on the Holy Spirit, relying on God. Really, all of this points to Jesus. It points to our Savior. We are to put on Christ, as Paul wrote in Romans 13. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Here it is. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our armor. Put him on, stand firm in your faith, and endure to the end. Amen? Praise God. Well, as we close in prayer, I, I shouted out to you a, a gospel uh, presentation. I, I did a bit of an altar call. And if you did pray to receive Christ, we want to know about it. Now, you can message, message us here in this uh, video. You can send us an email uh, and, or call the church, 540-373-8683. Didn't know I, I knew that, did you? We want to give you a Bible. We want to give you a start Bible. We want you to start off right. So if you're there, or you're with some friends, or maybe you're by yourself, and you're just wondering what this is all about. Somebody may have told you to check it in. We want to give you a Bible, man. So we want to do that for you. So please, somehow, uh, talk back to us however way you can. Uh, give us uh, your address or, or call the church, and we will, we will mail you a start Bible. Okay? Or you can come by the church, 3625 Latimer's Knoll Court, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 22408. I can't remember much, but I do remember that. And for those of you, my brothers and sisters, we love you. We miss you, man. You know, uh, I know the Lord's going to get us through this, and, and one day we're going to be back together. So God bless you, man. Let's pray. Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you for this time we've had. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the fellowships going on in the home, Lord. And uh, we just love you, God. See us through this, God. And I pray for anyone struggling through this. And we do struggle, God. Uh, just help us, Lord, to get back up by the power of your Holy Spirit, to stand firm through this, and, and to be the witnesses that you want us to be, God. We love you and praise you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness. Find what you're looking for For God so loved the world that he gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in him Will live forever Bring all your failures Bring all your failures 
Bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. Thank you so much for joining us with Calvary at home. We hope that um, you're able to there with your family, get together and pray if there's a need. Um, we will see you hopefully this Wednesday on our live stream and again next week. God bless you. Thank you for joining us at Calvary at home. Our hope is that you are blessed by the worship and teaching of God's word. Listen, in uncertain times, we want to remind you continually that the gospel is rock solid because Jesus is alive. We want to encourage you to follow us on Facebook and to check us out on our website to keep up to date with what's going on at CC Fred and at Calvary at Home. There you can ask us questions and you can also send in prayer requests. We love you, we're praying for you, and we can't wait to see you next week at Calvary at Home.